Now we're getting on to some eave gutters, valleys and downpipes. The installation of gutters. Uh, gutters must be installed with a fall of not less than 1 in 500 for eaves gutters and 1 in 200 for boss gutters. So that's 5 mil per metre for boss gutters. Um, that is the minimum requirement. So I would suggest and recommend that you put a little bit more than that in. There's no harm in putting more fall in a gutter. Especially with their light framing these days, they seem to um, settle with other trades coming through. Um, and then you're left with some ponding and immersion and it's very difficult and expensive to remedy later. Eaves gutters, they must be supported by brackets securely fixed at stop, at stop ends and have more than 1200mm centres. So that's straight out of the code. I would recommend not using any more than 900 or 950. And eaves gutters must also be capable of removing the overflow volume. This volume will vary with locality and rainfall intensity. So that rainfall intensity keeps on coming up all the time and it's very important. Know where you are and the area that you're working in. So this is straight out of the construction code. The acceptable overflow measures. We've got a front face slotted gutter there. Um, a minimum slot only of 1200 millimetres squared per metre of gutter. So they'll be punched into the gutter by the roll former as the gutter's made. So you shouldn't have to be doing the maths on that. There's a control back gap, and this one's becoming more popular now. So that's uh, created by installing a, a 10 mil spacer behind the gutter, and that's installed at every gutter bracket. Uh, the back of the gutter is installed a minimum of 10 mil below the top of the fascia. There's a controlled front bead height as well. Um, that one is also gets used in um, a lot of custom folded gutters where we can't put slots in it. So if we want to make a, a specially uh, designed gutter and it was just folded up like a flashing, that's normally a, um, a method that is, can be used then. The end stop in weir, that's normally used um, post fitting uh, to a, a job that has issues. It's a method that can be easily fitted later on as post fitting. There's the inverted nozzle, it's in the code, I wouldn't recommend it, it just gathers lurts and leaves and, um, uh, around the nozzle and then um, once that um, leaf or dirt build up happens it uh, retains moisture and also that front, front face weir, um, once again um, no roll form is going to cut a, uh, a slot that big in their gutters so it would have to be post fitted and that can't be done very aesthetic so I wouldn't recommend that one as well. Acceptable overflow meshes on a rainwater head. Uh, rainwater head is fitted with a 75mm diameter hole in the outward face of the rainwater head and the centre light position 100mm below the top of the fascia. When we are fitting rainwater heads, we've got to make sure that the box gutter is fully sealed to the, um, the rainwater head, uh, not just entered and then turned down. They must be fully sealed. Valley gutters. This is straight out of the construction code. And that will, there is um, in the HB39, it shows a slightly different data, but I believe the construction code um, oversees the, uh, the HB39 as the only advisory standard. So, valley gutters on a roof with a pitch of more than 12 and a half degrees must have a width of not less than 400 mil and be wide enough to allow the roof covering to overhang not less than 150 mil each side of the gutter. Or when valley gutters on a roof with a pitch of not more than 12 and a half degrees must be designed as a box gutter. So we've got a valley gutter in a roof of less than 12 and a half degrees, very careful consideration must be put into your design at design level to make sure that we can fit a box gutter in there as box gutters have a great a depth. Downpipes, downpipes must not serve more than 12 metres of gutter length for each downpipe and be located as possible as to, a, as to a valley gutter and be appropriately sized due to the location and rainfall intensity. So once again that rainfall intensity we have to know the area we're working in and make sure that all our uh, gutters are sized to suit the area. Corrosion. Corrosion and ponding go hand in hand and dissimilar metals. So we've got all three of them happening at once here and we've got uh, ponding sitting in a gutter 
and causing that corrosion and probably some copper saturated water entering that. So ponding occurs when water pools on the surface. So it's not just gutters, it's the capping as well, that top capping there. All cappings must fall towards the roof of by uh, three to five degrees. If, the, if you don't put um, uh, fall on top of the capping, dirt can build up on the top of the capping. And then when it does rain, it'll all spill off on one edge. You've got this horrible dirty mark down the outside of your building. So it's always good practice to fall the gutters inwards on all buildings. So once again, box gutters, five mil per meter, eaves gutters one and 500, just to ensure complete drainage. So eaves gutters, you can get them up as flat as you like, as long as they don't hold water. Flashing and capping should be installed with inwards fall. Damage repair. It's almost impossible to install a roof to have actually no scratches at all. And if we've got minor scratches up there, Blue Scope recommends that you don't do anything if it's only a minor scratch. In fact, you leave it. Their technical bulletins um, state this and says if you can't see it from the ground, then you'd leave it alone. As zinc loom roofs have no colour bond paint on them at all, so a minor scratch in a colour bond sheet does not reduce the life of the product at all. So Blue Scope still do not recommend the touching up paint of minor scratches. It is their advice that minor scratching will not affect the life of the sheet and is rarely obvious to a casual observer. So here's some examples of some touch up paint that was used. The touch up paint becomes very obvious. Blue Scope still don't make the touch up paint. They don't install it and they definitely don't warrant it. In fact, their published data specifically says do not use touch up paint. Swarf. Swarf is something that um, uh, must be monitored by all trades on site. Uh, this could even be the job next door that someone's pulled out a grinder and the wind takes that bit of swarf, lands on a roof, window sills, and can be a real problem. So we all must be mindful of swarf. We must clean up our areas. If you're working on a roof doing um, some work above that roof, you um, must have to make sure you clean up your swarf daily, put some protection down, so when carbon or zinc limb steel is cut, still every or swarf is created. And when they're left to all exposures will corrode and cause rust stains. So quite often, light swarf, it's actually the particle that rusts and looks like the carbon's rusting, but it's not. It's just the swarf particle that's rust and it's left to stain. The swarf particle rusts away very quickly, quickly and just leaves a stain behind. Um, this is not detrimental to the longevity of the product, however, is very unaesthetic. So Blue Scope recommends that you clean up daily. If you've got high degrees of swarf, then that can become a problem. We must clean up all their screws, anything that's left over, a nut, a bolt, a screw left on the roof will take a long time to rust away and will do serious damage to the roof. So cleaning a swarf for mild staining, wash the surface with it diluted mild household detergent and fresh water and rinse off well afterwards. For severe staining, water blast the area with fresh water not exceeding 400 psi.